Hi, welcome to this workshop which is titled I Beseech Thee. Now, this is an embroidery workshop in which we will be making a textual amulet after the medieval practice, which will look something like, but not probably identical to, this. This is pouch and this is the textual amulet. So this object, or the one that you will be making, is it's a piece of everyday magic. It's a small textual object that you wear on your body which enacts change in the world. And in this case, the amulet is a reminder to be less productive, to rest more, and to engage with circadian and seasonal time. And it's a way of recognising the importance of saying no, so that hopefully we collectively work towards creating a neurodiverse new world order which runs on crip time. Now, rather than try to explain up the top all of my thinking about how this little object can do this, uh, I want you to be able to sit back and start sewing while I talk through some of the ideas behind this object that we're making together. And I often think of embroidery, you know, once you've drawn everything out, set everything up and done all of the things that require concentration and focus. It becomes this set of repetitive actions which become a form of physical archiving. So that hopefully when you look at the object you will think of some of the ideas that are brought up today. So in order for this to happen the session will be structured as follows. First I will run through the instructions on how to make the amulet and its accompanying pouch. And then after this, and we've gone through all of the instructions, I'll take you on a meandering train of thought on the power of words and language to create worlds and ourselves, covering the everyday magic of performative speech acts, the imperialist violence of standardised clock time, and more, taking reference from the likes of Legacy Russell, Ursula Le Guin, Sylvia Winter, and Practical Magic. So... All of the instructions will be at the start and then you can carry out the making of this entirely at your own pace. And if you at any point lose track of the instructions, you can pause the video and go back. Or if you don't want to do this in order that you don't lose your place, you can also refer to the PDF of written instructions which are on the page. There'll also be a video alongside the other more speculative discussion of me making the amulet and bag, so you can refer to this for guidance as well. Now, the workshop is about slowing down, so you can participate as much or as little as you would like or as you are able. So there's no pressure to keep up with the pace that the video sets or to do anything, you can just listen and sit back. Um, what you will need if you do want to make the embroidery is scissors, embroidery floss, needle, a rectangle of scrap fabric, approximately A5 or smaller, but I mean it doesn't have to be those dimensions, um, pencil or some kind of implement that can make a mark on your fabric, and measuring device, so a ruler or similar. Okay, so that's everything. I hope that you enjoy. So these are the instructions to make a little textual amulet like this one. Oh, I took it out the wrong way. Um, see, look, it says no, and it goes in this little pouch, and then you carry it on your person. You know, you can put it in your pocket or in your wallet or around your neck. Um, it doesn't have to be this size. It can be smaller or larger, but um, ideally it would be the sort of size which you can easily carry around with you. So the first thing to do is to get everything around you that you will need to make this. So the first thing is the thread which we um, sent in the post to you. Um, so this is called embroidery floss um, and there should be two reels in there and um, then the next thing is scissors to um, cut the thread, obviously, um, so they need to be sharp enough, not those like really crappy ones that you get in primary school to cut paper that literally do nothing, the most annoying things in the world. Um, needle as well should have been in the kit. Um, and 
a pencil and ruler or something that can mark make a mark on your fabric so if your fabric is very dark then maybe chalk is better also these are kind of optional because it really depends if you want to do this precisely then it's better to use a ruler um but if you want to just do it by eye that's also totally fine like if you're a scrappy binge like me um and you like things that are a bit more kind of um shonky then you don't need these um and then finally whatever it is that you're going to make the textual amulet out of now as you can see with this one i did it in two different but complementary fabrics one of them being a j cloth and one of them being a bit of um calico uh but you can do them in the same fabric or you can also if you don't have any fabric then you can also use paper and embroider onto the paper. The instructions will be exactly the same if you're using paper. There'll just be one point where it's slightly different and I'll tell you where that is. Now, just a note on the type of fabric that you want to use. Uh, it needs to be a woven fabric or um, not a knitted fabric and not a jersey. So nothing that if you pull it, it stretches. So, you know, like a t-shirt, it'll stretch. Um, just because you can embroider with jersey fabric it's a lot more annoying and fiddly and complicated and you usually need to do it on a hoop um whereas with this you don't need a hoop obviously i don't think j-cloths are technically woven i don't even know what they're made out of some kind of plastic it's quite horrific um but the key is it doesn't stretch so um it's not going to be a frustration to embroider with so I am going to show you how to do this using a piece of calico because it's easy to show you because it's cream, but you can do it on any colour. Um, it doesn't matter whether or not the thread shows up very clearly, arguably. I mean, that's your style choice. Um, but, you know, it says no on it, but the important thing is that you know that it says no on it, not that anyone else does. So it doesn't necessarily have to really be very clearly legible, I would say. That's your decision, obviously. So, like I said, you can make this any size you want. You can also make it any shape you want, but a rectangle or a square is the easiest way to go. Um, but you need to make sure that you make the amulet itself. So let's say we're making this all from the same piece of fabric. This bag needs to be twice slightly more than twice the amount of fabric that this is so this can't be more than a third of the total amount of fabric that you have otherwise you're not going to have enough fabric to make this as well as this so this one believe it or not it's actually a square when you measure it, it doesn't look like a square to me it looks like a rectangle but i don't know i think that's a constant optical illusion um it's six by six this is slightly wider than six that's probably why it doesn't look like a square because it's not a square um but let's say we're going to do a square on this one so um now this piece of fabric is handily like got kind of edges which are straight they're not completely straight but you know who cares if you've got a piece of fabric which is all over the place you can actually use a bit of paper is your guide for measuring as well um which is quite handy um because it will have an exact right angle on it so i'm gonna make a square which is six by six so what that means is that when i'm doing the bag the bag needs to first of all be slightly wider so that there's a seam margin so um so this one is eight centimeters wide which means that there's a margin of five millimeters for the gutter and then like an extra little bit for this to be able to easily get in and out because otherwise if it's too tight then it'll just crumple so this is eight centimeters wide this one is six centimeters wide so basically whatever the width of your textual amulet is you want the bag to be two centimeters wider so you've got one centimeter on either side and then it needs to be this this is made from one strip of fabric and the strip of fabric needs to be double the height of this so this is six centimeters so this is 12 centimeters you can make it ever so slightly larger as well 
so that it doesn't like stick out the top um so you could make it 13 centimeters i guess um or you know add a centimeter so i'm gonna start by marking out the fabric oh, the paper's but by all means do if you want to you know I have no idea if that was a complete right angle, by the way. I'm not, like I said, <laughs> I'm really not a very precise person, but like if it, in fact, looking at it, God, that really doesn't look like it's straight. But, you know, I really don't actually care. But um, if you are a person that is very precise, then by all means, like use a set square or a bit of paper to mark this out properly. I just, I don't know, I'm very scrappy. I like things that look a bit shonky. I think it looks more, I don't know, I don't want it to look machinish, but um, if you do, then no shade. Okay, so now I'm marking out the bag, which is eight centimeters wide, 13 centimeters long. wonky so glad I'm not like an architect yeah. if this was uh, me doing buildings then I think I would have several lawsuits on my hands okay now at this point I'm going to also mark out the gutter because it's easier to do it before the paper is cut. Oh my God, Rebecca, your precision skills are atrocious. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, right, so five millimeters in from the edge, I'm just gonna draw a line. And this is me marking out the line that I will sew along. Okay, and now I'm going to cut out the fabric. Oh, my goddamn computer has gone to sleep. Sorry, excuse me while I just reach across to turn on my computer again so I have the instructions. I did put it so that it didn't do that, it's like, you know, to go to sleep never, but apparently not. Okay, so, um, for the textual amulet, we're now gonna just mark out what we're gonna write on it, which I'm gonna suggest writing just the word no. Um, now, you can write this however you want. For this one, 
I did it with a double line and because of the type of stitch we did it's actually like I really shot myself in the foot with that it's easiest to do something which has which just follows one line so that you can go back on yourself easily so something like this or something like that or something which is hand writing -y, um rather than something which you can do one like this as evident it is it is humanly possible but it's just a, it's a bit more fiddly um yeah but just mark it out however you want um i think that's something quite potent about doing it in your own handwriting um seems like it would probably be more powerful that way but um yeah just however it's going to appear there we go no very simple Yeah, you can make it look fancier than that if you want, but also there is absolutely no obligation. Um, okay, so now that we have this drawn out, we need to get the thread ready. So the thing that we need to do is to split the thread. So how we're going to do that is, okay, now you never need to work with the length of the thread, which is longer than the length of your arm, because you're not going to be able to pull it further than that. And if you cut a bit of thread, which is too long, it'll be more likely to snag. So cut a length of thread, which is about the length of, from your finger to your shoulder. Um, now, embroidery thread comes in six strands but you never really most of the time you're not gonna be embroidering with something with using all six strands the reason for that is that it would create quite a kind of like a lumpy thread um and it's also just kind of wasteful because beyond a certain point the thickness doesn't translate to it being a wider line um it just kind of yeah so basically we need to split the thread and you can split the thread into whatever thickness you want um the thinner the thread the flatter it lies on the fabric so the more kind of precise and smooth your line but also because we're doing embroidery on a line also the thinner your line is going to be so it really depends on what style you want to go for and also like if you've got a fabric which is like very i don't know jazzy and it's got a lot of pattern on it and you need the line to stand out then maybe you want to go for thicker so if that's the case then i'd say go for three otherwise like two i guess i did this one using two strands but i'm going to split it into three so that i can just show you it's clean in half so you take the thread i've already started doing it um but you take the thread and you kind of like pull apart you'll be able to see that there are three stacks and you start pulling it apart like this and the easiest way to do this is to just to kind of hold those two strands there and pull back like that and you kind of want to smooth it while you go so that you don't tangle it which is already happening There is a knack to doing this, or there is not a knack that I have ever been able to fully master, but yeah. I have to say that having a video of me watching this is just really excruciatingly embarrassing because I'm sure embroidery experts would probably be watching this going like, that's not how you do it, which is true. Um, but I've never been able to master any of the techniques that they suggest online, so I just do it this way. Yeah, so eventually you should get the two strands of three, or if you're separating it into two strands, you'll get three strands of two. So tie a knot in one end, get your needle, which is that. And then I'm just gonna lick the end of my thread, make it easier to thread the needle.
Right. Okay, so the thread that we're going, uh, sorry, the stitch that we're going to be doing is called the Holbein stitch. Um, it's also sometimes called Spanish work, um, which is completely geographically inaccurate um, in terms of its origins, but it was called Holbein because it occurred in a lot of, oh, when was Holbein? 16th century? Um, paintings, um, and it was a type of stitch which was used a lot on collars and cuffs on white fabric, um, using black stitches, and um, Holbein painted it a lot, so it's called the Holbein stitch. He didn't have anything to do with the actual stitch itself, just the representation of it. So, if you know anything about embroidery, and there's absolutely no problem if you don't, um, but basically a Holbein stitch is a continuous stitch um, which is like a running stitch which you do all the way one direction and then you go all the way back on yourself in order to fill in the gaps so you start by start at one end of your N um, and now at this point if you are using paper before you start what you'll need to do is all the way along where you're sewing, you need to punch out the holes. Now, the reason that you do this is because when you're sewing in fabric, sometimes, unless you're some kind of divine being, then it's unlikely that every single time you punch your needle through the fabric, you will exactly hit where you are aiming to go. So for example, if I'm like, oh, I've got to like start at that end, I'll like be like, oh, no, oh, try again. And yeah, and so obviously that doesn't show up on fabric. But if you do that constantly on a bit of paper, then you'll just end up with like loads of little holes. And because these will all be around the line, it means that it starts to weaken it because, um, yeah, you know, this is structurally weakened. Um, so then the whole thing starts to disintegrate and um, it also just looks a bit scrappier. So if you punch holes in advance, then I don't know if you can see that, but um, but it means that you've marked out where you're sewing and then you can just kind of like, I'm not going to be able to do it now in video. Great, that's embarrassing. Um, you can use them as a guide basically and it makes it, it makes your life a lot easier. Yeah. So that's the only difference basically with if you're using paper, but everything else remains the same. So you start one corner um, and you just come up, pull the thread all the way through and, um, and then you go down again along the line. And the length of your stitch, you can make it like, you could make it like that if you want, or you could do any length that you want. Basically the smaller the stitch, the smoother the line, uh, but, you know, precision isn't everything. Some people prefer things to look messier like me. Um, I mean, even when I try and be neat, things end up looking messy. I mean, look at that, oh my God. It's not exactly the neatest. Um, so, yeah, the length of the stitch, the, the smaller the stitch, the longer it's gonna take you as well. So, precision, means it's slower but I mean you know that's also good slowness is good but non-precision is good so whatever your style is and whatever your preference is on time right so then you pull this through and then you leave a space of the same length as your stitch and then come up again and do the same Yeah. Right, okay, now let's pretend because <laughs> I don't have my little blue Peter sample of like, and this is one that I did earlier, um, because I am yeah, just not that prepared. But um so let's imagine that this is all the way to the end. Um when you reach the end, basically you then just go back on your so reach the end of this N, for example. Or, um, rather than you don't have to do that bit first you want to do the letters separately unless they're joined up but um, reach the end of whatever logical point your line reaches the end uh, then you need to just go back so you come up through 
I don't know if you're using paper with the same hole, it doesn't have to be exactly the same hole in the fabric, but the same kind of point. Um, and then you go back down. So now, as you can see, this is forming a straight line. If you are familiar with embroidery, but you're not familiar with the stitch, you might be going, how is this different from a running stitch? Like, this is exactly the same as like backward stitch, but it's not. It's got one crucial difference, and that is that it looks the same on the back and the front. So you can see you've got a clean line on the front and a clean line on the back. I did that the wrong way around, the front and the back. Um, so that doesn't matter so much for this, or maybe it doesn't, or, uh, but when you're doing the bag, it means that when you do a backward stitch or a running stitch, you end up with a double stitch on the back, which is like, it kind of looks a bit messy. So it looked messy on this. Um, so the whole bind stitch has that advantage. So basically, as I explained, the structure of today is that I'm gonna ramble at you while you're sewing. Um, so yeah once you've done this then where's my bag? Oh, there. then you fold over the bag and you do the same stitch along here now the reason that i suggest if we do the same stitch for everything is just so that i don't have to intersperse like I didn't want to set this rate where it was like, and now you'll have finished your no, when maybe you haven't and you'd like panic and be like, oh God, I haven't finished it. Or maybe you'd finish it really quickly and be really impatient to move on to the next stage. So the idea is I've set you, if I set you up with all of the instructions now, then hopefully you should be able to get on with this um, whilst listening to me rambling about other stuff, non-sewing related. I mean, kind of labour related. Um, so that... Uh, there isn't a kind of idea of me setting a pace, which feels very particularly important given that later I'll be talking about chrononormativity and the idea of operating on your own time. So do this at your own pace. And uh, if you have any difficulties, then there are written instructions as well, which supplement these ones so that you should be able to refer back to these and pick up where you, um, where you need to go next. So, I hope that this is clear and I hope that you enjoy continuing to make these. Um, yes, so now on to the next section. Oh yeah, one more thing that I wanted to say actually was um, these designs, they're very simple. Um, if you want, you know, you can add a border to it if you want, you know, like this or add some little patterns around it or something. I don't know. These are really ugly patterns. God, apparently I'm an artist, but you guys don't know it. Um, anyway, yeah. Feel free to add whatever you want to this design. You don't need to stick just with the word no. You can add anything to this as well. Um, you can make it as fancy or as minimal as you want. Um, obviously, like, it, you know, as a clarification, it seems a little bit arbitrary. But, you know, anyway, I like have fun with it is basically what I'm trying to say. If you want to add any patterns to your bag, then you need to embroider them before you sew it up because otherwise it's going to be a freaking nightmare to try and sew through one layer when these are joined together you'll just end up sewing through both and sewing the bag sealed shut in the middle which will be really annoying so yeah if you decide you want to embellish stuff on the bag as well then you just need to do the patterns before you do the seams and the final note that i'll say about the bag is I've shown this to you with the seams open, but once you've done the seams, if you prefer, you can turn it inside out. Okay. 
Human beings are magical. Bios and Logos. Words made flesh. Muscle and bone animated by hope and desire. Belief materialised in deeds. Deeds which crystallise our actualities. And the maps of spring always had to be redrawn again, in undead forms. So this is probably the most beautiful description of the human entanglement in language that you will ever come across. Sure, you can try and find a better one, but you won't, so just stop. And the quote from Sylvia Winter appears in an essay she wrote about Aimé Césaire, the Martinique poet and polymath who founded the Negritude movement. Césaire wrote widely on the importance of considering the limitations of scientific knowledge and the poetry itself constitutes a knowledge practice in itself. He famously said, Poetic knowledge is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. And Aimé Césaire is crucial reading if you are ever considering that poetry is a lesser form of knowledge making or that poetry is an idle or indulgent act which does not have material necessity, go and read Césaire and have your mind changed. But that's just to explain the context of the Sylvia Winter quote, and I want to come back to Sylvia Winter herself. Human beings are magical. Bios and Logos. Words made flesh. So what Sylvia Winter here points out is that language is not simply an act of latter description. There isn't a teleology whereby a world exists and humans come along and invent a language in order to describe it and themselves. Instead, these three things are interconnected and deeply enmeshed in a constant feedback loop. Humans, worlds, language. So here there is a diagram of a loop, and at the top of the page is the word humans. Below it, to the left, is words, and to the right, worlds. There are black arrows connecting the three words in a circle. And as Winter is pointing out, we make ourselves through language. We are not fleshy lumps which language poorly describes, although, yeah, okay, it may do that too. But crucially, language also makes us. Ah yes, the word performative. So, lately, the word has come to the fore in relation to acts performed, usually on social media, um, in particular things like performative activism and performative wokeness. So, in this context, the word performative has a specific meaning which is action which is the opposite of authentic. So performative activism is activism you do in order to be seen to do activism rather than because you're rioting or campaigning or protesting or boycotting or speaking out in support of the cause itself. Now obviously there was a lot of that around the time of the Black Lives Matter protests on Instagram as well as also a lot of fellow white people accusing other white people of performative action in order to not make their own actions seem performative, which is a very meta-performative. But anyway, this is what the word means overwhelmingly now, a performance which is disingenuous, a performance which is the opposite of authentic. So... Here is an image of two cropped screen grabs of Twitter on a pink background. On the top one, a user called Chaos tweets, Judith Butler, gender is a performance. Everyone, oh my God, so wise. Judith Butler, don't be a cop. Everyone, haha, what a kidder. And the second tweet is from a user called Lars Goetia and reads, gender is a performance and I plan on getting booed off stage. And... Okay, as a sidebar, I agree with the first tweet in principle, in that, yes, we should listen to Butler's thoughts about defunding the police and finding new and radical non-violent forms of living together. The only issue is the joke is structurally flawed by the fact that Judith Butler never said gender as a performance. So, 
Judith Butler is often cited as saying gender is performative. And because of the general usage of performative now to denote something that is relating to performance, this means that there's a misinterpretation of what Judith Butler actually said 30 years ago. So people think they did say that gender is a performance. Now, some or many or all of you may already know how Judith Butler was using the word performative. But maybe you don't, and that's also fine. And I'm not one of those people that is going to say at any point today, or hopefully ever, oh, you probably know, oh, you should know, or it's widely known. Because, I mean, widely known by who? And these phrases are in themselves normative. And to clarify, normative means, and this is a dictionary screen grab uh, on a pink background, the text reads normative, adjective, formal, and then on the next line, establishing, relating to, or deriving from a standard or norm, especially of behaviour. And then, in inverted commas, negative sanctions to enforce normative behaviour. So, in the context of humanities and philosophy discourse, the word normative is used to refer to a standard which is imposed, usually with the implication that it's for a moral good. So anything that's usually tied up with the word should, for example, heterosexual marriage is normative, because of both social expectation and, you know, tax cuts. Having children is normative. So, these phrases, oh, you probably know, oh, you should know, you are probably familiar with, as we all know, they reinforce the idea of a baseline of very specific knowledge, which then becomes canon. And this canon has historically been overwhelmingly white, middle-class, educated, European, able-bodied, cisgender males, who are, of course, able to speak for everyone. Now... Butler is, of course, a non-binary queer theorist, but the fundamental point is that not everyone has to read any one text because all knowledge is highly specific. If you've ever studied art and been told that you should be familiar with Deleuze or Derrida, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about and you can see how this knowledge becomes normative with the idea that you should have read something. Actually... To be honest, I don't even believe that knowledge is purely formed from citational academic practice anyway. I mean, this can be a massive stumbling block to introducing radical thought because it becomes harder to assert something within academic discourse if the assumption is that you have to rely on a citational practice in order to back up what you're saying because if someone hasn't already published the thing that you're trying to say and given the history of who traditionally is within academia you can start to see the problem. So I'm not going to assume that you've read anything because you don't have to read. That doesn't mean you're not committed to your ongoing knowledge practice in some other way. Um, but anyway, back to Judith Butler. Judith Butler said, In this sense, gender is not a noun, but neither is it a set of free-floating attributes. For we have seen that the substantive effect of gender is performatively produced and compelled by the regulatory practices of gender coherence. Hence, within the inherited discourse of the metaphysics of substance, gender proves to be performative, that is, constituting the identity it is purported to be. In this sense, gender is always a doing, though not a doing by a subject who might be said to pre-exist the deed. So this is quite complex and because Butler is writing within academia, their writing is actually quite dense. So to pick this apart, throughout Gender Trouble, Butler was using J.L. Austin's lectures on language. J.L. Austin was a linguistic specialist and semiotician and he described performative utterances as a type of speech that exists which is A, they do not describe or report or constate anything at all, are not true or false, and B, the uttering of the sentence is or is part of the doing of an action, which again would not normally be described as saying something. So these are statements which do not describe a pre-existing state. They are statements which create something. So the examples that he gives are wedding vows. So I do, 
doesn't describe anything that already exists. It's something which is an action in itself, but the speaking performs an action. He also provides the example of naming a ship. So I name this ship, declaring something in a will, and also betting. Um, he says very cutely as an example for betting, I bet you six pence it will rain tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> it was written in the 50s. I mean, sure, John, I will take that six pence bet. The point is that with all of these statements, in saying them, you change a reality. So you are not describing something pre-existing. The statements then perform something so that they carry something out. They enact change in the world. So when Butler was saying gender is performative, what they meant is not that gender is a performance in which you're an authentic nub of interiority which then meets the world with a facade which is purely a lie. I mean, there are many instances where this may be the case, where you need to mask because it's not safe for you to be able to express your gender identity or you're not ready to do so, or you don't know what that is. But Butler here means that all cases of binary cisgender are performative in that the reproduction of gender norms and gender normativity reinforces and itself produces gender so gender is the product of its constant reinforcement and its constant reiteration here is an image of a gender reveal party there's a table with food on it and a background that is blue on one side and pink on the other the banner across the top reads boy or girl and the words are separated by a cartoon mustache and a cartoon heart below the banner are balloons in the shape of the words boy and girl Predictably, boy is pastel blue and girl is pink. It's a really hideous image. So by this logic, every gender reveal party is in fact a gender creation party or a gender recreation party. Not just for that unfortunate person to be, but for wider society. The only reason that binary gender persists in Western culture is arguably because we keep buying into it, keep reproducing it and violently imposing it upon other cultures. And on that note, for example, uh, this is the image of a book cover. It's red and in white letters reads, The Invention of Women. Then below this in black letters, Making an African Sense of Western Gender c Discourse. So Dr. Oyo Ronke Oyowumi's work demonstrates that the category of woman did not exist in Yoruba land until after European colonisation and that age was the main organising principle. And... Maria Lugones, as well, is um, a decolonial theorist who says gender is a colonial imposition, not just as it imposes itself on life as lived in tune with cosmologies incompatible with the modern logic of dichotomies, but also that inhabitations of worlds understood, constructed, and in accordance with such cosmologies animated the self among others in resistance from and at the extreme tension of the colonial difference. So what both these theorists and what many other decolonial theorists and feminists have written about is the fact that gender, binary gender, is highly culturally specific. There is nothing universal about it except for its violent imposition due to colonialism. And what this colonial imposition of gender highlights is not just that gender is this accident that we, I mean, who even we, is this nebulous we, uh, all keep buying into but there are very real reasons as well why western histories of gender imposition colonialism and capitalism are all inextricably linked and why it keeps reproducing itself as largely to do with control and regulation of labor production and reproduction it's reductive to say that gender arises and persists solely for one reason it's a multi-pronged amorphous beast that's incredibly complex and deeply embedded, even if it is a fucking lie. So in the essay, Gender is a Workplace Technology, Helen Hester argues, gender may be productively understood as a form of workplace technology, not only in the sense of being a tool put to use during wage labor, but also in the sense of operating as a domestic labor-saving device. As with all these technologies, Gender is not operated in the same way in all contexts, but or by all people, and work comes to attach itself differently to particular bodies at particular times.
Gender both assists in the performance of certain labours while hindering others and demands to be seen, at least in part, as a response to the historical development and current conceptions of cultures of work. Resistance to work must also be resistance to gender and vice versa. And Legacy Russell, too, says that gendered bodies are far from absolute, but rather an imaginary, manufactured and commodified for capital. So you can see through this that the history of colonialism, as obviously inextricably linked with the history of capitalism, shows why there would be an agenda that was tied to labour for the importation and violent imposition of the gender binary on other cultures under colonialism. So what these scholars demonstrate is not only that there's nothing essential about gender, as in biologically there is nothing essential, but also there's nothing inevitable about it, except that it's a tool for subjugation and power relations in order to produce capital. So a lot of the world that we inherit, we end up reproducing, which isn't to say that if I wake up tomorrow and decide to stop this, I have the power to end white patriarchy alone. And unfortunately, this we that I have lazily invoked is actually really nebulous. But I also don't want to think that we or I have absolutely no power. So back to the word performative. In summary, there are two very different definitions of the word performative. One, performative as something false, such as performative activism. Two, performative as something which performs change, which creates or recreates something in the world. And it's really annoying that these two things, which are almost <laughs> contradictions, share the space of the same word. In his essays, or actually they were lectures which are transcribed into essays, um, Austin used another way of describing this type of speech. Uh, he used two other words, which are constative and illocutionary. But he then goes on to say, oh, these aren't really sufficient. So he just really runs with performative and a world of confusion and incorrect memes about Butler follow. But I want to focus on this latter idea of words being able to perform change in the world, to consider the power of words to enact change. And this is a theme that permeates the works of Ursula Le Guin. And here's an image of a book cover in shades of orange and red. It's divided into four images. Uh, the top left image shows a person in front of a glowing red dragon. The top right has two figures entering a dark cave. One is holding a glowing staff. The bottom left shows a person standing among the bones of a dragon. And the bottom right shows a person standing on a cliff edge against a glowing red sunset with a dragon flying in the background. In the middle of the images, on a black background, a text reads, The Earth Sea Quartet, and the whole thing has a very late 80s graphic design feel to it. Now, The Earth Sea Quartet was one of my favourite books growing up, or technically it's a series of four books, or five, including the later edition to the series. And I read it again in my early 20s and I read it again a few years ago and then again a few months ago and each time I find something new and rich in it, it re is, it's really wonderful. Now the premise of this book series is that the world of Earthsea in everything in this world has a use name and then it has a true name. Now dragons are the only creatures which speak this language of true names as their general dialect when they're going about their day-to-day -day basis. Humans don't. Humans use the use language in their everyday speech. Um, most humans don't know the true names of objects or of each other because everyone also has a true name and a use name. But wizards who are educated through a centralised educational system and, witch and witches who are lay practitioners. And by the way, the book series does have a very intentional critique of that as a highly gendered structure. Um, magical practitioners use the true names in order to control matter. And this is how you work magic, by finding a thing's true name. Most people don't reveal their true names to anyone or only to a very select few, because if they do, they would leave themselves incredibly vulnerable to being magically controlled. And in the book, it says, to weave the magic of a thing, you see, one must find its true name out. 
In my lands, we keep our true names hidden all our lives long, from all but those whom we trust utterly, for there is great power and great peril in a name. Once, at the beginning of time, when Sigoi raised all the isles of Earthsea from the ocean deeps, all things bore their own true names. And all doing of magic or wizardry hangs still upon the knowledge, the relearning, the remembering of that true and ancient language of making. So I think we can question the idea of like an essentialist language, as in things have true essential selves which are ready to be discovered. I think we can do that. It kind of implies a sort of true nature which is fixed and might coalesce into some kind of biological essentialism. I don't know. But to come back to Sylvia Winter again, human beings are magical. Bios and Logos. Words made flesh. Muscle and bone animated by hope and desire. Belief materialised in deeds. Deeds which crystallise our actualities. And so, yeah, okay, the human world is entirely enmeshed with language, as we are ourselves. I don't want to go all anthropocentric and assume that cats or peacocks or slow worms or mud or sofas, any of those things, give a shit about words. Um, I would argue that there is an interspecies language which is touch, but that's a sidebar. I'm not going to be tempted down because I'm, as you can probably see, very tempted down sidebars a lot. So to come back to what Ursula was saying, what Judith Butler and what Sylvia Winter and what John L. Otten were saying, is... Crucially, that language has the power to enact change. Here is an image of a black and cream book cover. It looks like a woodcut, and in the middle it reads, The Mabinosian, translated by Lady Charlotte Guest. The words are in a frame of patterned scrolling leaves, and it's a very kind of Victorian does medieval style. Now, The Mabinosian is a collection of 11 Welsh medieval stories, which were gathered in the White Book of Rytherk, circa 19... No, 19? Circa 1350. And the Red Book of Her Guests, circa 1400. These are actually never meant to be collated into one text, but they were all lumped together in the 19th century under this title. And in the fourth branch of the Mabinosian, Aaron Rode uh, repeatedly curses her own stun by stating, I will swear a destiny. And for each curse, the boy and his father have to find an ingenious way to work around it. So she says... I will swear a destiny that he shall not get a name until he gets one from me, so they trick her into naming him. And I will swear a destiny on this boy that he shall never get weapons until I arm myself, so they trick her into arming him. And I will swear a destiny on him, she said, that he will never have a wife from the race that is on this earth at present. And for this latter curse, they charm a wife for him out of flowers, which is quite lovely. Um, But the point is that throughout this book in a lot of the texts there's no question throughout the Mabinosian that to speak something is to bring it into being and the power of language is taken as a given okay the word abracadabra an initial search for the etymology of this word will tell you that it comes from the Aramaic phase which means I will create as I speak or the Hebrew words for the trinity however A very small amount of digging will tell you that this is in fact not true, but an ongoing misinterpretation that began in the 19th century. Listen, generally, the 19th century is a terrible time for false historicism based on their, at the time, presentist values. For example, see the Victorian skewing of medieval culture as barbaric and brutal in order to make themselves seem less barbaric and brutal. Uh... The skewing of embroidery and sewing as allegedly historically always highly gendered, which it wasn't if you look at any guild records. Uh, The use of Darwinism to uphold racist brutality and the impression of disabled people. I mean, these are the ones that occur to me off the top of my head, but listen, Victorian Western society was in many ways actually far more racist and sexist than the pre-Enlightenment Western culture, for example, the medieval era which isn't to say the medieval era was halcyonic it definitely wasn't indentured labor was definitely a thing there was a lot of anti-semitism but instead perhaps the victorians are basically the end game of centuries of colonialism industrial capitalism and the desire to distort and fabricate so-called science in order to justify the oppression of vast swathes of the population in order to justify their hoarding of resources 
all the while while trying to paint themselves as the pinnacle of, of evolution, when in fact they likely represent a bit of a regression in terms of justice and human rights. And that's also simplistic because obviously there were plenty of humans in that mix who didn't ascribe to the dominant thought of the time, we can hope, and my Christ, I hope that no one in 200 years' time looks back and thinks that everyone who lived in this country was happy with Brexit, the Tories, the rollback on disability support, ongoing white supremacist society, and the continued existence of the monarchy. But, so back to Abracadabra, and here's an image of an Abracadabra pendant. It's a gold pendant on a black background, and the pendant is a triangle pointing downwards, and inside the pendant it reads, Abracadabra, Abracadabra, Abracadab, and it continues going down the pendant, losing a letter each time. And at the top of the pendant are two stylized birds, and then the two sides of the pendant are each flanked by a scarab beetle with its wings open. And next to this, other words explaining the image, which read a Victorian era talismanic pendant with abracadabra inscription. Now, the first written record of this word appears in a Latin medical poem, De Medicina Precepta, by the Roman physician Quintus Serenus Samonicus in the second century AD. Now, Serena Simonicus said that to get well, a sick person should wear an amulet around the neck. A piece of parchment inscribed with a triangular formula derived from the word which acts like a funnel to drive the sickness out of the body. Now, it is genuinely thought that the word is older than this and that it derived from the Semitic languages. And according to Steve Caruso, an Aramaic scholar I found online, the attribution to the Aramaic, as I said, 19th century didn't occur to 1891 but the point is not necessarily even the origin of the word that's not to say that it's not important uh because obviously it is um but for the purposes of today the reason why i am citing abracadabra is not because of what it may or may not mean but instead what it may do and at the time that it appears in this latin medical poem according to simonicus the word drives sickness out of the body so, in this case, words are material and as capable of enacting a cure as any plant or any other medicine that you might use. The words are material, the words are object, and the words have a power. So this brings us on to the topic of medieval textual amulets. And here are two images side by side of the front and back of a textual amulet. This one is in rolled lead. It actually looks a lot like a flattened stone that's flaking, um, and the engraved letters are just visible, but it's not possible to read them. So, I will tell you how this whole textual amulet obsession of mine began. I will tell you what it all began. I was doing research into this Bosch painting called The Cure of Folly. And here's an image of the Bosch painting, which is portrait. In the centre of the painting are four figures, and the scene seems to be depicting a sort of surgery. On the left is a person who's standing wearing a funnel on their head and they're standing over a person sitting in a chair. The person on a chair has a wound on their head and the person with the funnel seems to be removing a bulb-like object from the cut. To the right of this person in the chair is an older person holding a tankard um, and on the far right is the last person who is wearing a book on their head and leaning their elbows on a table whilst watching the operation. Above and below the image are gothic letters, which they're not really legible, and they're in Dutch, which I don't read, so that probably also le lends it to me thinking it's not legible. But they translate, apparently, into English as Master, quickly cut away the stone. My name is Lubbert Das. So I was researching this painting, and on the very brief Wikipedia page, which, okay, let's be honest how we all begin our research no shade and here is a screen grab of the wikipedia page for the painting and the section that i want to read is uh at the bottom which says the woman balancing a book on her head is thought by schema to be a satire of the flemish custom of wearing amulets made out of books and scripture a pictogram for the word phylactery otherwise she is thought to depict folly so I went to the footnote, which led me to a book called Binding Words, Textual Amulets in the Middle Ages by Don Schema. And I thought, wow, this book sounds incredible. And it sparked an idea for a workshop. So I thought, I will buy the book, which I then did. And friends, it is so dry. Honestly, do not buy it. It's like 
trying to listen to a slug giving a lecture in slow motion. It's like really, really dull. And also simultaneously really fascinating. I don't know how someone could manage to do that. But anyway, before I get onto the topic of textual amulets, um, just a note on this Wikipedia quote and the reference to phylactery. Now, phylactery is an ongoing Jewish practice with deep historic roots of wearing scripture. And I have no intention of appropriating ongoing contemporary Jewish practices. The history of wearing of scripture is not paradigmatically different or separated from the more widespread use of textual amulets and they actually share a history and the quasi-pagan Christian practice of doing so was directly heavily influenced by the Jewish practice of phylactery so they exist in the same cosmology but it and it's also important to note that when anyone talks about medieval Europe they're not talking about monolithically white Christian culture and people of different religions, cultures, ethnicities, nationalities, and races, and yes, race did exist as a concept in the medieval West, albeit in different conceptions and different languages. And if you want to learn more about this, I strongly recommend the work of scholar Geraldine Heng, who says in an interview about her work, um, does the word race have to occur before there are racial practices and racial actions or racial phenomena? I think not. I think that sometimes the phenomena, the institutions, the actions happen before there is an adequate vocabulary to identify them, to name them and to discuss them. So in the medieval era, people of different religions, cultures, ethnicities, nationalities and races lived alongside each other, sometimes easily, sometimes uneasily. There were tensions and sometimes there was violence, which is the crux of Heng's argument. We don't have to have a specific word for it for it to be identifiable as a structure of difference and othering, particularly in the case of violence and segregation. But the crucial point is Europe was not monolithically white. Don't let those alt-right idiots fool you. Uh, this is another image of a textual amulet. There is a page of finely printed black letters on a cream page, possibly parchment? In the middle of the page is a rectangle containing a collection of tiny charms, uh, which are possibly sewn on to the page. Uh, they seem to be arranged in some kind of pattern. There's an engraved cross, a branch of coral, some coins. And resting on top of this sheet is another sheet of paper with a black and white image of the Madonna and child. So in terms of textual amulet, it's not really accurate or useful to tie this practice to one specific religion much as Don Schema really tries to hammer at home, it's like, this is Christian! Because it's more a practice which is reflective of a much broader cultural understanding of language and its place and power within the world. And while different communities adjacent to each other might have different religious belief systems, they did inevitably influence one another. And in the case of textual amulets, as I said before, the Jewish practice of phylactery directly influenced people who practice Christianity uh, actually, apparently, because they were kind of jealous of this practice. Um, and so while I'm not saying it's possible to completely ignore or just sidestep a person or a community's canonical religion, particularly at a time when this was so incredibly dominant, um, I'm specifically interested in textual amulets which don't specifically reference canonical religion and have more of a horizontal relationship with change. So that's to say... They don't invoke a creator to ask for the creator to intervene. They don't say, dear God or dear saint, please make this change. Rather, the texts themselves are a form of intervention. So it is the words themselves that make change in the world. Such as, for example, abracadabra, which can drive sickness from the body itself. So maybe I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. We need to define what exactly is a textual amulet. And here's an image of an older textual amulet. It's a square of parchment which has an illustrated image in the centre and then handwritten lettering around the outside very densely. There are dark marks in a grid pattern across the page which suggests that it's been folded. And Don Schema describes textual amulets as the following. Textual amulets, in general, contain apotropaic magic, i.e. protective magic. Textual amulets were portable devices filled with apotropaic text and images just i really hope that i'm pronouncing apotropaic correctly i've never heard anyone actually say it so i apologize if you're all laughing because this is not how you say it anyway it's how i'm gonna go on saying it so 
They were believed to give the bear a magical protection against the demonic forces that were blamed for everything from plague and sudden death to toothache and bad luck. We now regard the once common ritual practice of wearing textual amulets as magic, but in the far more uncertain world of the Middle Ages, they promised protection and healing to their users. Most often worn or carried on the body, textual amulets were one of the most widespread manifestations of the written word in the medieval world, and they were used at all levels of society because of an almost universal belief in the magic power of particular words, symbols and images to world off email. A concatenation of scriptural quotations, divine names, common prayers, liturgical formulas, Christian apocrypha, narrative charms or historioli, magic seals, words and number squares, characteres, non-standard or magical script, devotional images, crosses and other religious symbols and amulets offered divine or supernatural protection to their bearers. Traditional Christian elements were supplemented over the centuries with elements borrowed from pseudo-Solomonic magic and Kabbalah. Medieval sources often referred to the textual amulet as brevis or scriptura in Latin, and equivalent terms in the vernacular. For that reason, one can think of the textual amulet as a magic writ, that is, a piece of writing that looked like a brief official letter, writ in English, folded or rolled so that it could be worn on a person's body. So, what I was saying about the texts which have a horizontal relationship to change. Now, in the medieval West, Christian religious belief wasn't oppositional to science or folk medicine or folklore or myth or superstition. Often these things would exist alongside one another. For example, if you read any transcribed Irish mythology, which is much older from an oral tradition but was not written down until the mid to late medieval period, St. Patrick just like randomly gets inserted into these stories about the Tuatha de Danann, who are a supernatural group of deities that he just like, they all exist in the same cosmology. There's no questioning the fact that these gods exist alongside the one true God. It's just which God do you choose? Um, so everyday belief systems might not necessarily fit into canonical Christianity, but also doesn't necessarily mean that they are canonical. And this is also true of lay and folk herbal traditions and which may be sealed with, uh, the invoking of a particular set of words um, which have nothing to do with Christianity. So, back to the Bosch painting, titled The Cure of Folly. Uh, I came to this painting because I have, for the last year or so, been doing research on medieval lapidary medicine. And so obviously it's called The Stone of Folly, so there's a reference to stones, and lapidary medicine means anything to do with stones. Uh, what I love about a lot of the lapidary texts of this time is that stones have this really unquestioning animism and they can affect weather, your fate, the seasons. They can divine truths about people. Usually these truths are moralistic and misogynistic. Usually it's relating to like to divine the fidelity of your wife or whatever, which is or like to find out if she be a virgin. It's highly problematic, but they can also cure sickness or they can produce it. So... To give two examples in the Peterborough Lapidary, Beryl. Beryl is best against strife and ensures that a man may not be overcome. Also, he allows a man to bear suffering. Also, he gives good understanding and he is good against the sickness of the liver. Balas Ruby. The book tells us that whoever bears very many Balas Rubies and shows them to his enemies, he may return again whole and safe. And whoever touches the four corners of his chamber or of his hall or of his garden, neither worms nor tempest will do harm to that house. So in the same breath, stones can affect your internal organs and they can affect what's going to happen to you. They can control worms and they can control whether or not you're going to die in battle. And animism and materiality course through all medieval conceptions of the world and objects such as stones all hold this power, which is, I mean, arguably kind of secular. Uh, you know, it's not preordained by God, or maybe technically it's preordained by God, but it's not in that specific instance that God says, like, this stone will do this thing. Um, it's more that the stone already automatically holds that power. And in the same vein, words, specifically written words, are objects. They are objects of these textual amulets. And they're objects which, worn on the body, can affect change. And this is 
a magic, which isn't to say that it isn't real, rather the opposite. It's actually just to say that magic is actually fairly mundane because, you know, it exists everywhere. To highlight this point, I would like to insert the following scene from Practical Magic. Belladonna. It's a sedative. People put it in their tea to relax, calm their nerves. Some people also use it as a poison. Which people? <laughs> Which people? Aha. Uh -huh. Witches. Witches. Mm -hmm. I guess you found me out, huh? Yeah. Yes, you did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You should come around here on Halloween. You'd really see something then. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we all jump off the roof and fly. We kill our husbands, too. Or is that outside your jurisdiction? Do you have any idea how strange this all sounds to me? I, I, I got people telling me that you're up here cooking up placenta bars, that you're into devil worship. No, no, there's no devil in the craft. So what kind of uh, craft do you do? What do I do? Mm. I manufacture bath oils and soaps and hand lotions and shampoo. Mm. In the ants, um, they like to meddle in people's love lives. Magic isn't just spells and potions. Your badge? It's just a star. Just another symbol. Your talisman. You can't stop criminals in their tracks, can it? It has power because you believe it does. I wish you could believe in me. Miss Owens. Hmm. Are you hiding James, Angela? Not in this house. Okay, so it's kind of gross in that, yes, it's like unquestioningly upholding the idea of law enforcement, which is a bit grim. But the point is that the separation from magic of magic from the everyday is actually a project of early capitalism in the West, one which is charted wonderfully by Silvio Federici in her book Caliban and the Witch. And this is a purple book cover. To the right is the image of a person wearing a dress with long hair trailing down their back. And their head is leaning back, possibly in pain, um, and they're holding open the front of their dress to bare their chest. And on the left reads the title and the author of the book, Caliban and the Witch, colon, Women, the Body and Primitive Accumulation, Silvia Federici. In this book, she outlines also the relationship between gender and the creation of capitalism. This process of primitive accumulation requires the transformation of the body into a work machine and the subjugation of women to the reproduction of the workforce. Most of all, it required the destruction of the power of women, which, in Europe as in America, was achieved through the extermination of witches. Now, I haven't really explained this properly. I've kind of touched on the fact of the relationship between gender and labour, capitalism and colonialism. Federici is one of the key scholars of um, gender as a form of labour regulation. It's very complicated that that's why it's a book, obviously. That's why all of these scholars have written books and not tweets about this. Um, so I hope I can do this justice. But Federici's argument is basically that the branding of women as witches was a means to an end. Um, it was a tool of uh, discounting specific forms of knowledge and specific forms of labour, um, which was necessary in order to create the structures which uphold the brutality of capitalism. So capitalism as a brutal structure, obviously it's massively hierarchical and still to this day can only exist through unpaid labour, indenture and slavery and through the production and reproduction of a workforce. So a part of this project was a simultaneous need to both control and devalue women's unpaid labour and women's knowledge, um, particularly around reproduction and midwifery, 
but also otherwise um so also to do with medicine and herbal and folk cure uh this was in the medieval west where gender existed in a binary already um and a part of this devaluation was a shift in medical knowledge and birthing where medical practitioners sought to discredit the knowledge of midwives and control the birthing room which was all part of a pro process of discrediting the knowledge of women um in order to see their unpaid labor as natural um and a wider project of upholding their subordinate societal role as well as uh centralizing knowledge of the birthing room um and so in all of this witchcraft became a really convenient vehicle for mass social control and a massive societal shift in the perception of specific behaviors so these forms of secular transformation in the world such as herbalism folk remedy these kind of quasi-pagan practices such as sexual amulets um rather than in the medieval era you know they exist in a complex sometimes ambivalent and sometimes like mm, maybe not um but not necessarily explicable relationship with christianity suddenly they become very clearly not Christian. They are witchcraft, therefore the devil's work. And this wasn't because they were necessarily cracking on, down on the devil. Maybe the individual people who were going around looking for witches were thinking that. But the overall reason that this became such a movement is because it was such a fantastically convenient way to control and create a very specific gender paradigm. So to follow Federici's argument, there was a good reason why you'd want to stigmatise this knowledge, but the stigmatisation of certain forms of everyday magic, it really was actually collateral damage in order to create this violent new world order which we're still living in. And it means that in the West, we're living in this world where also there was the rise of scientific rationalism and the centralisation of knowledge um, and magic becomes this thing which is not real i mean for example did you know that most scientists uh in the early renaissance actually practiced astrology as part of their practice like galileo gave astrological readings um so the idea that magic isn't real eventually starts to become more and more prevalent um and now we're in a world where secular western scientific rationalism sees magic as not scientifically provable therefore it can't be real which is insanely arrogant because you know we perceive things th through the limit of our five sense and senses and duck bill platypuses perceive everything electromagnetically through their bills so how the hell you can say that humans are possibly able to perceive everything in the universe is like beyond me but anyway so magic is real, obviously, because, you know, we don't understand everything in the world. Um, so this is what we're going to be making, a textual amulet. And this is another image of a textual amulet um, or a series of textual amulets and the pouch they were kept in on a white background. And um, there's a small blue woven fabric pouch in the bottom right, which looks very worn and scattered around it are folded pieces of cream printed paper. So it's a, we're going to make a textual amulet or this is what we're making. Um hopefully while I'm yammering on you haven't given up and are still sewing away um but also no worry if you're not like you know do what you want I'm not I'm not the boss of you but it's a textual amulet to invoke change in the world and in yourself and in your place in the world because words are material words are powerful words are magic and it's important that it's something that you can wear somewhere on your body um historically a lot of textual amulets were worn around the neck so that ideally it would hang over your heart and cover it like a shield uh, to quote don schema again they could be positioned on the body like bandages to cover wounds and afflictions read devotionally like prayer books gazed upon like portable icons carried ceremonially into battle like shields affixed to walls like broadside or poster placed on valuable livestock vineyards or cultivated land to protect agricultural bounty bounty sorry moulded into ingestible substances such as bread or cheese and ingested as a form of sacred medicine and rinsed in water so that some of the iron gall ink would wash off to produce a potable word therapy. In addition to protective use, textual amulets could be used aggressively in the manner of black magical necromancy by placing them in physical contact with other people in order to bind and control their actions. Please do not 
grind yours into an ingestible substance because I have no idea what would happen if you swallowed the thread. Um, so I want us to make something that's easily wearable and you can position this over your heart or carry it in your pocket. A lot of these textual amulets would have been written in ink or printed as the images show, but I don't know, I think there's something really powerful about sewing. Maybe because I just think that with objects that you make, the amount of energy it will carry, it feels like there's some kind of correlation with how much time you focus on charging it with a certain power. So if you're spending a decent amount of time sewing this thing while I yammer on and you're probably still sewing it, then it carries a lot more intention than something that maybe you just quickly scrawl on a piece of paper. Which brings us now to what to write and why I specifically suggested the word no. Okay, back to Sylvia Winter for what, like the fourth time is it? It may actually even be the fifth. I don't know, I've lost count. Human beings are magical. Bios and Logos. Words made flesh. Muscle and bone animated by hope and desire. Belief materialised in deeds. Deeds which crystallise our actualities. And the maps of spring always have to be redrawn again in undead forms. So... As I outlined when talking about this first section before, the point is not a fatalism that we're doomed and prisoned by words, but as per Butler and Austin, words are performative and constitute the world, which is an incredible moment of reckoning because it means we can literally recreate the world through language, collectively. So as we focused on the first part before, now let's look at the second section. The maps of spring always have to be redrawn again in undead forms. So... Let's do this. Let's redraw some fucking maps. Now, I am autistic and dyspraxic. Again, this is going to sound like a complete sidebar, but there's a reason why I bring this up. Part of this double whammy, I don't know, maybe it's not actually a double whammy because the two neurodiversities are actually massively comorbid. So it's not like I've got one and then the other one. Oh God. It's more like they coexist together. But a part of this is I really struggle with executive function. Executive function is a technical term in psychology. It's defined on understood.org as follows. Some people describe executive function as the management system of the brain. That's because the skills involved let us set goals, plan and get things done. When people struggle with executive function, it impacts them at home, in school and in life. There are three main areas of executive function. They are working memory, cognitive flexibility, also called flexible thinking, inhibitory control, which includes self-control. Executive function is responsible for many skills, including paying attention, organizing, planning, and prioritizing, starting tasks and staying focused on them to completion, understanding different points of view, regulating emotions, self-monitoring, keeping track of what you're doing. Now, I really struggle with basically all of these things. I think a lot of neurodiverse people do. Also, a lot of neurotypical people do. Um, I find it really difficult to deal with general life admin, with inboxes, with replying to messages, with keeping up with housework, with emails, with doing multiple things at once. Um... I haven't filed my tax return yet because I had so many deadlines. Thank Christ this year there is a delay on it. That's what I'm going to be doing next week in a panic. So this quote says something about juggling multiple tasks. And I don't even know what that means or how people juggle multiple tasks. Like, how do you do this? Um, and why am I telling you this? Okay, I made a note recently to myself about this because... I've been really struggling the last couple of months and I've actually been struggling a lot more than when the first pandemic hit and I've been a lot busier with work. I think it has a lot to do with executive function. So here's what I wrote to myself on the 6th of February. By the way, it's not all in complete sentences, so it doesn't necessarily make a huge amount of sense. People finding things hard in the pandemic because suddenly the easy everyday things became difficult and something they needed to think through. Okay, that's not a full sentence, but it's a premise. When the pandemic first hit, I seemed to cope a lot better than other people I knew. Because as an autistic person, 
with executive dysfunction and an OCD person with agoraphobia, I already had adaptive strategies for working around executive dysfunction and difficulties with my everyday. This did not make them any easier. Rather, it felt like suddenly the world was operating at my speed. So what I mean here is that when everyone suddenly found going to the shops really difficult and a big palaver, it was like, oh yeah, welcome to my world because going to the shops has always been really difficult for me. Um, now that things have become more normalised and strategies have been found, as in strategies for working around these difficulties, it feels like the world has sped up again. So I am finding this pan stage of the pandemic infinitely more difficult than earlier because of the expectation of managing speed, etc. I do not wish for global trauma, but I do wish the world would slow down again. So... I don't know. I think the issue is the standardised time of late capitalism is built on an idea of linearity and progressive time rather than a cyclical and seasonal notion of change which loops while shifting. And it's just so goddamn fast. One thing that's really important actually to think about with time zones as well is the standardisation of time as a form of imperialism. Sure, I mean, it came about because basically everywhere had local times. So different towns would run on different times, which then became a massive safety problem when it came to railroads in America. Because, you know, what time is the train scheduled on their departure or their destination? So you could see the problem with regard to crashes. But quite why the railroads needed to therefore dictate the lives of literally everyone else is never questioned. And why this had to then filter on outwards so that the entire world became standardised on this time of Greenwich Meridian time, which places England literally at point zero. It's like, what? And also, you know, the idea of every single human having immediate access to a timepiece is really recent, which I want to think about more because I want to think about this idea that I feel too slow for the world because what is too slow? Like, what is the default speed? So the idea of having access to a clock which tells you the precise time is really, really recent. I mean, I don't know if you remember, like, you know, 10 years ago before all phones were set with the internet clocks, like everyone's, you set your own clock in your phone and maybe it was like 10 minutes slow. And before that, uh, now, okay, Chinese and Arabic scientists were well ahead of Europe on pretty much all technologies and timekeeping was no exception. And in the European West, mechanical clocks were invented. They were invented in the 14th century and they were not widespread. It would be like, you know, your town has a clock. Um, there were other forms of clocks before this, obviously. Candles, water clocks, sundials, which had, would have to be calibrated to a specific longitude or latitude. I can't remember which one. Um, and there aren't any real, there isn't really an originary creator who can track back to who created the first water clocks. But there are examples from the 16th century BC in Egypt and in China in the 6th century BC. Um, but you have to think that the evolution of how timekeeping exists is not something which is an objective development of ever increasing accuracy but specifically what time comes to mean ideologically is highly bound up in what its cultural significance and its cultural use value is. The specific differing ideologies of cultures led to specific ideas about how time should be measured and who should be doing it. For example, the desire for more accurate timekeeping in the West was bound up in the desire to exert ever greater control over the worker and to um, extract more hours from them. Back to Silvia Federici, who says, Capitalism also attempts to overcome our natural state by breaking the barriers of nature and by lengthening the working day beyond the limits set by the sun, the seasonal cycles and the body itself, as constituted in pre-industrial society. So time, as that like <laughs> time, as it is understood today, is an invention of sorts. Uh, here's an image of the cover of a book. On a white background is a red circle, a yellow circle and a grey circle overlapping each other and inside another black circle in, and a white circle reads the title On Time, A History of Western Timekeeping. So this book is, uh, it's quite an interesting look at the history of time specific to the West, although he does reference Chinese, Persian and Arabic technologies, especially as these had a massive influence on the West. And 
It's, I mean, he just said it at the start, I want to offer a word of caution about imagining progress as inevitable or the Western way of doing things as superior. Despite this caveat, the story of how the world came to be governed by European ideas of time is informative because it is the story of imperialism. So, the idea of time as it exists pretty much globally now is a European idea of time, but that isn't to say that it's, you know the inevitable progressive idea. It's literally just, as Ken Monshine says, a, a form of imperialism. Uh, yeah, and to think about the big question, you know, what is time? And I'm so glad that I'm finally making a thing where I get to ask the question, what is time? It makes me feel so like a bro. Um, where is time? Who is time? Are you time? Am I time? Is time me? Um, maybe Monshine wasn't asking those questions, but one thing he did say that does actually kind of answer all of them is the idea of time progressing at a constant rate is no more than a convention, a convention contrary to most human experience, but nonetheless convenient for regulating activities such as work, factory production and trade. Now, another thing that Monshine points out in this book, aside from the fact that Time is completely relative, um, which actually made my head explode because I'd never really thought about this before. And here's an image from medieval illuminated manuscript and two figures stand inside a deep blue circle, which is outlined in gold stars with a large gold sun in the top right and um, a dark grey moon in the top left. One of the figures appears to be pointing to the moon and the other to the sun. So what Monshine highlights is that Contemporary ideas of timekeeping originated in the observation and tracking of celestial bodies, as these are the most predictable moving objects to, uh, to observe, including the sun rising and falling. So timekeeping, historically, in its origins, was, by and large, almost universally intended initially as a way of keeping track of the movement of the sun, the moon and the planets. And it's only as timekeeping technologies became ever more fixated on precision that it became a question of not using observable phenomena to mark time, but instead this conception of time as something mathematical which exists discreetly and abstractly against which to measure observable phenomena and which observable phenomena will never measure up to this perfection and precision. Something that the book doesn't actually ever explain that I would really like to know is how do you measure how precise something is? Because surely the most precise thing is the only measurement that you have to know precision. So how can you know something isn't precise until you have the thing that is perfect? I don't know this. If you can answer this for me, please let me know. It is so annoying. Anyway, we don't need to quote Einstein to acknowledge that time is relative because everyone knows it. Four o'clock in December is objectively not the same as four o'clock in July. Like they're completely different. Four o'clock in July, you're halfway through the day. Four o'clock in December, you're at the end of the day. That's it. So also, you know, what the hell was time in the first lockdown if you weren't a key worker? And actually to highlight this point, Eli Grober wrote this text and it's published on the McSweeney, which I don't usually read. Uh, someone else sent it to me. And it's only true if you're not a key worker and you're working from home or you're stuck at home. It's important to know. Now, I have to say, generally, I find this kind of, like, gentle, jocular humour usually really annoying. Which is no shade on like Grover, it's just, it's, it's their style, fine, go with it. But it's not usually the type of thing that I read. But I find that I can actually look past it in this piece just because it's so true. So it's a short text and I'm going to read it to you in full. Here's How Time Works Now by Eli Grover. Here at Time, we've made a few changes you may already be experiencing that we think you should know about. Please see below. A minute. A minute used to be 60 seconds long. We thought this could be spiced up. A minute can now either be one hour or it can take 3.5 seconds. We hope you enjoy this new feature. A day. You may remember that a day used to take place over the course of 24 hours. We felt this was too much. A day is now over the moment you are first ask yourself, what time is it? It does not matter what time it actually is when you do this. 
As soon as you ask or think what time is it for the first time that day, even if it is still 10 in the morning, it will suddenly be 8 at night. Does that make sense? A week. A week was once measured over the course of seven days. Our testing showed that this has been way too short for way too long, so we made a big adjustment. A work week now takes an entire year. From Monday to Friday, you will feel like it's been, and you will actually age an entire year. This is non-negotiable. This brings us to a weekend. A weekend doesn't exist anymore. You will go to sleep on Friday and you will wake up on Monday with a vague memory that you may have watched an entire TV show, every episode, every season, sometime in the last 48 hours. A month. Let's talk about months. Months used to be pretty inconsistent. Some months were 30 days, some were 31, and one was 28 or 29. This seemed too confusing, so now they are all four days long. That's right, every month takes four days. You'll get to the end of the month and think, wow, that felt like it was only four days, which used to be one day shy of a week, but is now just one ninetieth of a week, because a week is a year and a month is four days. And you'll be right. A year. Now, I bet you're wondering what a year is. Well, I hate to say it, but we're all wondering what a year is. The guy who was in charge of readjusting a year just quit, and he won't talk to any of us, so your guess is as good as mine. But I think it's going to be a pretty long time. Now, as I said before, the time that I operate on is objectively slower than the time I feel pressured to keep up with. Perhaps this is because my processing speed is measurably described as slow according to learning difficulty tests. Actually, I think being slow is a good thing. I mean, what's wrong with slowness? Why do we always have to privilege action and speed and movement? My processing speed is literally only a problem if you take measurable clock time and your schedule as a default and not an imperially produced highly specific means of controlling workers and implementing means of neo-colonial forms of trade and communication through outsourcing. Now, Elizabeth Freeman also writes chrononormativity, which, note, has the word normativity in it. Uh, chrononormativity is a mode of implantation, a technique by which institutional forces come to seem like somatic facts. Schedules, calendars, time zones, and even wristwatches inculcate what the sociologist Evatar Zurubavel calls hidden rhythms, forms of temporal experience that seem natural to those whom they privilege. Manipulations of time convert historically specific regimes of asymmetrical power into seemingly ordinary bodily tempos and routines, which in turn organise the value and meaning of time. The advent of wage work, for example, entails a violent retemporalization of bodies once tuned to the seasonal rhythms of agricultural labour. So, for example... There is the idea of an average working day being eight hours. I can't work for eight hours in a day, especially not in front of a computer. Jesus. Yeah, turning back to Federici again, who says, From the point of view of the abstraction process the individual underwent in the transition to capitalism, we can see that the development of the human machine was the main technological leap, the main step in the development of the productive forces that took place in the period of primitive accumulation. We can see, in other words, that the human body, and not the steam engine, not even the clock, was the first machine developed by capitalism. Slightly horrific thought. Um, so the mechanisation of human labour, which is to say the creation of this human machine. Actually, do you know, this is really interesting if you look at historical shifts in Western understanding of, an of anatomy at the time. We kind of saw this transition to this likening of joints to pistons and the shift into thinking of the body as mechanistic. But anyway, all of that and the idea of a machine body, it demands that you have a normative, able-bodied body. An actually, like, completely impossible body. A body which doesn't tire, which can just switch off and on, which has no aches and pains, which is available for work for the hours that are demanded with absolutely no problems and no strains. So perhaps where workplace normativity arises in the nexus of the clock and the human machine, both of which are disciplining tools. And if you're disabled, maybe you operate on crypt time like me. The world doesn't necessarily make space for that, how difficult it is for a lot of workplaces just to make space for medical appointments without you actually having to take holiday or childcare, which obviously is highly gendered labour, or sick leave 
or the ability to work within the your own time schedule and you know the fact that maybe I would find it overwhelming to have to get the tube and then do a full day's work which I didn't even recognize was the problem with so many of my jobs in the past but if I was allowed to work from home I would get a lot more done also I don't really like the language of like I would get more done because why again is productivity and speed the most important thing and in the art world generally I mean it's kind of changed since the pandemic kind of not as much as it should and it's kind of springing back to its old default chrononormativity and ableism and the overall structure has been historically that the timetable honors the existing art spaces not the people whose work it's supposed to facilitate an overwhelming majority of whom will be neurodiverse anyway so it's quite bananas that the artists are lowest on the rung in terms of consideration of labour, but Elizabeth Ann Moore says, A few years ago, I accrued several debilitating diseases in a process some call falling out of time. I now function on crip time, which, to crips, means we operate on a different schedule. We require more time to perform certain tasks than is usually allotted under the regimented, efficient system of standard time. The phrase is also used disparagingly. Okay, so it wasn't until recently that I really started vocally speaking about the fact that I operate on crypt time. And it wasn't until really recently that I wrote my own access rider. Now, I really have to credit the incredible ongoing work of Joanna Hedber, who wrote The Sick Woman Theory. This is a screenshot of the top of the web article, and there's a large image at the top of a person in a red dress with black lipstick, lying on a bed surrounded by pill bottles. And in the bottom left of the screen grab reads the title, Sick Woman Theory. So... Hedver has been very outspoken about accessibility in the art world and it was after reading their access rider which they have published that I finally wrote my own but you know what full honesty I actually still feel really embarrassed sending it which I shouldn't and please don't take this as any encouragement or endorsement for you to take on this shame uh, if you're umming and ahhing about sending it please don't I just want to share my difficulty with doing so in case it helps because I think it can be really difficult. I mean, I'm a people pleaser and not only that, but I'm also just worried about spaces not wanting to work with me because I don't know how it's going to land. And this is a big structural problem of a lack of job security in the art world. It's hard to assert yourself and your needs because you don't know how it's going to be received. You don't know if people are going to say, well, actually, no. Or if they're going to think, mm, God, this person's a bit difficult. I'm not going to work. I don't want to work with them again. The idea of being flexible as being the ultimate attribute is highly problematic because it re requires able-bodiedness and a neurotypical profile as well. I would like to say I'm incredibly blessed because uh, every single person that I've met and worked with in the art world have all been really supportive and I've never actually encountered anyone who's been like, eh, no. I mean, that it sounds insincere, but it's entirely true. The issue isn't the people, the issue is the structure, which engenders a total insecurity and a power structure that makes it difficult to push back or assert your needs because artists have like so little stability with their income and so little stability with, you know, it's not like it's a career, clear career progression. Now, I was talking about the winter quote and the need to draw some freaking maps. So to come back to the idea of performativity. So the things that we do in the world create an ongoing world. This is just a form of everyday magic. So what do I do when I say yes to multiple things with short deadlines, when I'm already at capacity? What do I do when I apologise for replying to a non-urgent email a week later because my executive function is just shot to shit, but I still think that I need to reinforce this idea that I'm an adult professional and I'm doing adulting and ooh, I'm sorry that I didn't reply, but this is very uncharacteristic. What happens when I work well in excess of the amount of labour that the fee covers? I tell you what happens... I reinforce the idea that this ableist pattern of working is okay. And this is not just about taking care of myself. This is also about creating a world which is safe for fellow disabled and neurodiverse people, as well as people who are not middle class and don't have the luxury of expanding into their free time in order to make work because their time is otherwise taken up with low wage work, which means that comparatively I set myself as somehow being allegedly like better or more invested in something. It is time for a neurodiverse, a temporal world order, it's time for us to start doing this by setting some boundaries on the expectations placed on your labour. 
And that is whether you're an artist or whether you're an actuary. Legacy Russell says, the idea of a body carries this weapon. Gender circumscribes the body, protects it from being limitless, from claiming the infinite vast, from realising its true potential. Now, a lot of the people that I've referenced have talked about the relationship between gender and labour and language, which may seem like it's not really relevant to the idea of time. But as I, as I hope I have demonstrated throughout this rambling diatribe, actually these things are all deeply embedded within one another. One of the sad things about Silvio Federici is that while her writing could actually be used as a really strong argument for gender abolition, she ends up stopping short of this and basically coming down as a bit of a turf. I'm not going to air exactly what she says. Basically, she kind of says, just because gender has done literally no good in the world, that doesn't mean it's beyond redemption. And it's like, really? Do you want to die on that hill? So I much prefer to turn to Legacy Russ and her recent incredible book, Glitch Feminism. And to be honest, when I was planning this workshop, I really actually didn't think I was going to be talking about gender this much. Uh, but to talk about labour and disability and chrononormativity and the regulation and machination of bodies, like I said, gender is just inextricably bound up with this, which isn't to say that gender is a limit point. Um, and the reason that I want to talk about Legacy Russell is for this point. If I reach a limit point, I literally can't work anymore. It feels like a failure. And I can see this as a failing to live up to expectation. Or I can see this as a failing of a wider world, not even those people that I'm working with, because it's not their fault. It's just a, a failure of the world to make space for disability and other modes of relating. So the more that I say yes to unmanageable workloads, the more that I create a world where unmanageable workloads become the default. And obviously there's a massive financial privilege in the ability to say no, which is all the more true given the increasing difficulties in gaining disability support support since 2010. Thank you Tories, fuck you. So I'm not trying to suggest that people turn down work which makes it untenable to survive. And if you have to work, you have to work. And you can still resist the work, you can still refuse the work through your no, even if no one else sees it or hears it. Legacy Russell says, what does it mean to find life and to find ourselves through the framework of failure, to build models that stand with strength on their own, not to be upheld against those that have failed us as reactionary tools of resistance? So I hope that this thing that we've made together is this. It's a talisman and a reminder and a protection that will collectively work some everyday magic to overturn worlds of hyperproduction, capitalist time. It's a talisman and a reminder and a protection. And it will collectively work some everyday magic with the aim of overturning worlds and world orders of hyperproduction and capitalist time. And I mean, maybe for you, there's something more important that it performs. Maybe it's something really highly specific. Maybe it's about a refusal to be codified within a gender binary or any form of recognizability. Maybe it's doing something completely different. As Legacy Russell says, uh, the body is a text. Every time we define ourselves, we choose definitions, names that reduce the ways our bodies can be read. Language is a form of empowerment and it's a form of limitation. And I'm not going to tell you what this thing should do because that is up to you. And I hope that this textual amulet becomes something which is performative, which does enact some kind of a change and that you can carry it with you and it empowers you and inscribes difference in the world. <laughs>